And it's good to be with everybody and to enjoy this study of God's word. We appreciate Andrew's message and trust that we'll learn as we live our lives to appreciate more of the word of truth as it's brought to us by whomever it might be. We want to continue our study of Jude, and I would like to go to verse 5 where we left off last week. We had mentioned this, but I'll go through it again. Notice he says, I will therefore. Therefore means I will in the light of what I just told you that's so important. Put you in remembrance, though you once knew them. We mentioned about being reminded of things we've already been taught last week. How that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. And let me pause here to say this. Here is a good way for us to see how God intended us to use the Old Testament, although we're under authority of the Christ as revealed in the words of the New Testament. The Holy Spirit guided you to reach back over to the Old Testament and say, here's what happened to those who believed. They followed Moses. They were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, yet we find they sin. And ultimately, um, only Caleb and Joshua, those 20 years old and upward, that left Egypt, entered into the land of Canaan. We're talking about thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that died in the 40 years of wandering, which 40 years were brought upon them because they didn't believe God and they didn't obey him. Another point to be kept in mind here is that to say, I don't believe God, doesn't mean that I deny Christ as the Son of God, that God exists in the Bible, the Word of God. When the Bible uses this, that they did it in unbelief, or they didn't believe, it takes a consideration of living active faith, as James discusses in chapter 2 of James. It means an obedient faith. You can mentally assent to the fact that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. James says the devils do that, and they even tremble. But they're still devils, and they're not saved. So merely assenting to the fact of the case that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God and the Savior of the world, even admitting that he's the way, the truth, and the lie, and no man comes to the Father but by him, that alone will not save a person. It is an obedient faith that saves a person. And this is what happened to the children of Israel. And inspiration picks that here with Jude, as he did with other inspired writers of the New Testament, to say to Christians, you are a Christian. How did that happen? Well, if you missed Andrew a while ago, then you understood the plan of salvation for the alien sinner. How a person becomes a Christian when one's alien sins are washed away. How one is baptized into Christ, a born of water and the spirit into the kingdom of God. Well, of course, that's the starting point. It's essential. It's necessary. But you see that those people who were baptized under Moses, a type of Christ, in the cloud and in the sea, a type of baptism, they still lost their souls because they didn't continue faithful after they were baptized into Moses in the town in the sea. And you can read all about that in the way the Holy Spirit had Paul use that to warn Christians as he wrote to the Corinthian church. And here Jude is doing the same thing. So this helps us in understanding how we today, under the authority of Jesus Christ in his New Testament, are to use the Old Testament one way, to use the Old Testament to help us better serve the Lord. And that ties in with what Paul said in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, when he said, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So he does this in verse 3 of Jude. And then notice he goes back into eternity in verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate. In other words, these spirit beings 
the word angel literally means from the Greek word angelo means a messenger. These uh, spirit beings and man's created a little or the angels, they had a certain state. They had a certain place God created them to occupy and to work. They were ordained to a certain uh, conduct. Well, they didn't keep their first estate. Obviously, they had free moral agency. They decided that they would uh, depart the very position God created them to fill. So they left their own habitation. Notice their own habitation. And what does he do? Well, he's still just as true to his word in eternity with the angels that did that as he is to men today. He hath reserved the everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. So this tells us there is a place to which he assigns both sinful men and angels following the death of man, such as the Hadean world recorded in the uh, account of the rich man of Lazarus that Jesus gave in Luke chapter 16. It's a place of departed spirits awaiting the day of final judgment when God will judge men and angels. So, God is true. He's just. He's consistent. He applies everything just as it ought to be and doesn't subtract anything from it or add to it. It's just perfect as it is, flawless. So notice how many of these Old Testament examples Jude uses. And again, the Holy Spirit inspired him to write this. So since God wrote the Bible via the Holy Spirit, then God wrote it. So the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. Notice the word reserved before I leave this. They are put in a place to wait because there's a place that's reserved for them. And he's talking about the judgment. But then he comes back over to the patriarchal age. Those in class on Sunday morning remember we introduced the patriarchal age in our right division of the word. That 2,500 year period from Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 to the giving of the law of Moses to the Jews as far as the Bible is concerned, the division in the Bible at Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 20. So he's in the patriarchal age, the father rule period. And he's dealing with Sodom and Gomorrah. That was in the days of Abraham and Lot. And the city and the city is about them in like manner. Thus, we don't think that much about it because we talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. But the cities around about them were acting and living in the same way. What were they doing? Giving themselves over to something, to fornication. Uh, pornea is any illicit sexual conduct, specifically outside of marriage. And going after strange flesh. Now he talks about what Paul does in Romans chapter 1, when Paul is discussing the Gentiles and their desire not to obtain God of their knowledge, and God gave them up. Strange flesh. Why use the word strange? It's strange to the will of God. It's strange to the truth of God, in this case, concerning man's conduct in sexual matters. God never intended that a man lie with a man or a woman with a woman. That is against nature. So this was strange flesh. Uh, some people try to say, well, there wasn't any homosexuality going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, they were just not hospitable people. People have actually made that argument. It's the reason God destroyed those cities. Well, here the Holy Spirit through Jude, and he does elsewhere the same thing, makes it clear that they were involved in unnatural sexual acts. But it's not just that they were involved now and then in such things. Notice he says they gave themselves over to this. To fornication. Going after. Just remember how it's described. When those men came and almost knocked down the door to get to those angels. Desiring to know them. 
as it is said. Notice that the strange flesh, and notice they're set forth as an example. Well, it's a negative example. We sing the song for little folks sometimes about Nadab and Abihu, and that's an example. But it's one for us not to follow. Because remember, they offered strange fire. Well, what is strange fire? Fire is fire. It burns you any way you look at it. Well, the strange fire was that it was not authorized by the law of Moses to get fire for where they got it and use it as they used it. And so they were destroyed by fire themselves. So it is. These are an example or a pattern that we should not follow. Notice, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Fire that came upon them and destroyed them as the angel brought it about according to the will of God for Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, we see how that we can use these things of the Old Testament to teach people about God's justice and about what is going to take place. When men choose their own way, go against nature, and live such terrible, ungodly lives. Then notice he says, likewise, there's something else like what I just said in verse 7. He called them filthy dreams. They defile the flesh. They misuse it. They abuse it. Well, anybody that keeps up, although it's not a good thing to keep up with, except to know how bad it's gotten, with all of the heinous, horrible crimes that go on, of how many people are given over every kind of filthy thing under the sun when it comes to going awry the law and being a hardened criminal. Notice they defy the flesh. They despise dominion. What have you seen over the last many months, in fact, years, among a great many people? They despise dominion. They despise authority. They despise the law. They make light of law-abiding citizens. They don't respect it. They go against it. How much more they can do so, we don't know. But I think you can go a whole lot further than what many of us even consider. So they're filthy dreamers. It's on their mind. They're dreaming about it. It's ever on their mind. They're cultivating it. And they're perverted. They despise proper authority. They despise anybody in authority. And they speak evil of dignities. So they don't have the proper respect for men in official governmental offices or anybody like that. Now, we know, of course, that God has taught us in the Old and New Testament to respect people in government offices. I think you can see this put into practice if you look and how Paul, in defending himself and in doing so preaching the gospel, addressed Felix, Festus, and Agrippa. He respected their office. He respected their position. Now, individually, their characters were worthless. But yet, there was that respect. And that's the way it ought to be. So, likewise, also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Uh, we might ought to say this ought to cause us to realize too uh, that we can uh, not show the proper respect for people in civil government offices or even other kinds of offices that should have respect. Now notice in verse 9, yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. Now that's an interesting passage. He's trying to show in view of what the context is in verse 8. The respect that is due these people on earth. And he says, even Michael, an archangel, now, this tells us, being that God is somebody that does all things decently and in order, we would expect to find that certainly in heaven. And when we see an archangel, that's an angel who has authority over other angels. And we find him described as contending with the devil himself. 
Now he's already told these brethren in verse three, contend for the faith once delivered to the saints or once for all, the American standard says. I might mention there that actually the force of the Greek is uh, once for all delivered for all time is the force of that. I don't think I mentioned that earlier, but that's the force of the Greek that's translated once for all delivered. So yet Michael the archangel was contending. Well, he's contending with the devil and there's a dispute going on between the two. I don't know what all that was about as far as what they said to one another. It was about the body of Moses. Well, I'm not talking about the fleshly body of the man Moses. If I say, what is the body of Christ? Why, surely you realize that the church is the body of Christ. The kingdom of God is the body of Christ. And so it is that when he talks about the body of Moses, he's talking about the children of Israel. Now, of course, Satan wanted to destroy them. And he was successful to a great extent as far as many, many thousands of individuals. It tells us something. We see a little bit behind the scenes here. It tells us something about the conduct of angels outside of our vision in the world unseen by man and outside of material things. And he's saying that he did not bring against him some sort of emotional fit we might describe we describe ourselves he just simply rebuked him and said the lord rebuked him now i don't know all about that but i know enough to know he's trying to say that when you contend you contend properly with the right disposition when i see paul putting this into practice when i see peter and john putting it into practice in the book of acts I see them plainly stating, no uncertain terms, with their mouth, what they will do and will not do concerning the charges, the case of Peter and John, don't preach any more in Jerusalem in his name. He just simply says, you, you be the judge. We cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. So that was contended. And so it is that we know we must because remember, that's the force of this letter, is to remind these brethren about these folks who crept in slyly by the side door, unaware. And you have an obligation to remember what you've already been taught to contend for the faith, the whole system of salvation and any component part of it. And you have to earnestly do so. You don't like uh, combatants. I don't mean using carnal warfare. If you don't like to engage in combat, then you don't need to expect to be faithful to God because there is a combat that Christians are expected to engage in in order to be faithful. If not, why in Ephesians chapter 6 did Paul tell uh, those brethren to put on the whole armor of God? Why put on armor if you're not going to fight? There was the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the shield of faith, and so on. So it's obvious, as the old song used to go, the soldiers of Christ the Bible are onward Christian soldiers. So there's a way to do it. And we need the proper training to know how to engage in the spiritual warfare that faithful Christians must engage in to keep the church the Lord's church and expose error and those who teach it. Now these, according to verse 10, speak evil of those things which they know not. That's not that unusual. All people have to have on their minds in order to speak against something if they don't like it. But they can go to the extreme on that, and they can hate it, and that's all it takes. And thus, they speak evil about it. Remember how Jesus was treated on earth. They made all sorts of false charges against him. And they were not true. And so it was when it came to the early church in the first century. All manner of persecutions brought about them. 
by charges made against them that were nothing but lies. That's one reason that we're to be ready to give an answer unto every man that asketh us a reasonable hope that's within us with meekness and fear. That meekness and fear ties in to what he's brought out in verse 9 of Jude here. But nevertheless, we're to fight. There's a way to do it. There's a way not to do it. It's interesting that God has permitted us and authorized us to do with the mouth and the tongue what he will not allow one to do with the hand and the fist. Except some of my brethren can't even be able to speak out against error that they see as error. But this is saying, you need to be mindful of the fact you've already been taught that your obligation to defend the faith or any part of it. These speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves. That tells me that a person who is created in the image of God can so corrupt himself that he acts worse than these lions and leopards and such like out on the plains of Africa when they go about fighting the hyenas or tackling some antelope. That's what the brute beasts do. They're just moved by their senses, uh, what's built into them. They don't use their minds correctly. They don't reason correctly. They just act on the fleshly level. And then look what he says in verse 11. You're going to be that way? Here's what he says. Woe unto them, for they've gone in the way of Cain. Now we learn something about the character of Cain here, don't we? Well, we do. Yet this is the New Testament, thousands of years after the days that Cain walked this earth. But we see the type of person he was. He was a brute person. He was not persuadable by the truth of God. He killed his own brother Abel. Because Abel kept the commandments of God and offered the scriptural sacrifice. And that made him so mad at his brother, he killed him. So that's the way many people are. Now, Christians need to be aware that there are a lot of people like this. And you understand why Jesus taught at one time to not cast our pearls before swine, lest they rend you or trample them underfoot and turn again and rend you. Well, what's the nature of swine? Well, they don't appreciate pearls. They're brute beasts. They operate the way swine operate. They have no appreciation of the truly valuable. So there are people like that. And we're not to force things upon them that they don't love and that they hate, that they fight against. Now, we don't know sometimes people are like this till they've heard the truth. But yet when they hear the truth and rather than embrace it and be thankful for it, repent of their sins and obey it, they immediately begin to oppose you. These are the ones that certainly persecute the faithful. Well, what do we do about that? We get away from them, if at all possible. We're interested in those people who are reasonable, who will receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save their souls. Remember, Paul asked the Thessalonians in their prayers for him that they remember him that he be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith. And he also asked them in that same verse that he would be remembered in their prayers to be bold in his preaching. Well, he knew about people like this that Jude wrote about. And he dealt with them all his life. So, notice, woe unto them, for they've gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam. Well, you have to go back and have a good study of Balaam. We're not going to do all that right now. But you can find out about Balaam in Numbers chapter 16. Uh, he was called on to uh, curse the children of Israel. And make a long story short, he wouldn't. But he wanted money so bad, he figured out a way to get the money without delivering a direct curse on Israel. He just told Balak that uh, you get them to go out here and their men all get tangled up with these wicked, adulterous women. And they'll commit fornication, commit adultery and all that. 
and God will punish them for you. God will destroy them. So that's what he means when he when they ran greedily. He was greedy after the error of Balaam. There are other people like that. They can be in the church, by the way. And so not only does this apply to those outside of Christ, it applies to those who are in Christ. Remember, he starts this off, that these have crept in unawares. So he's not just talking about those who are not Christian, those who are outside of Christ. He's talking about brethren. Remember Paul's statement, now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in latter times some shall depart from the faith. Well, what has he said in Jude 3? Faithful Christians are contend for the faith. Well, here are people that left the faith. To leave something means you had it. They had obeyed the gospel. They were members of the church. Well, they gave heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, and begin to teach false doctrine. So these are folks that are going to show up in the church. Paul even pointed out when he wrote to the Corinthians, that these things would show up in the church to test and to show who really is faithful. And those churches that want to just put up with people living any ungodly way they want to, and certainly not demonstrating their faith in God and his system of salvation or their love of God, they're demonstrating right the opposite. So these are spots in your feasts of charity. Well, that sounds like the end church. These kind of characters found in a church member are bad. That's all he's saying. Notice when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Then he begins to describe their, uh, describe their character even further. They're carried about the wind, Trees whose fruit wither without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the root. Well, what worth anything like that? They are not worth anything. And these are they who slipped in the side, in the side door. They crept in. And you've got to be on your guard. You've got to be careful. And these are things that always will be the case as long as we're on this earth in serving God. A great many brethren over the years I've seen lament and wail, and I guess they'd been in a culture that still used sackcloth and set in ashes. They would have done that because, oh, we got another problem to find. Life's a problem. And if you've got an idea that you're going to get over this battle and there won't be any more, then you're up for a rude, rude, and sad awakening. The devil's going to see to it that there's a battle to be fought first in your own mind against him, and then in those roundabout. Thus to the elders, Paul said in Ephesus, pay heed unto yourselves and unto the flock over the which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops or overseers. He says to Timothy, pay heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine." Continue in them both, and you'll save yourself and them that hear them. Well, that's never ending. That's always as long as you're on this earth, possession of your faculty. The devil's not going to leave us long. What good does it do to point out time and time again that the devil goes about as a roaring lion, seeketh whom he may devour? And we're telling ourselves all the time, well, if we get through with this trouble in the church, there won't be any more. And we lament. The next time something hears its end. Well, I like what a fellow said many years ago, insofar as problems in the church and faithful brethren facing them and overcoming them with the word of God. He said a church is either just getting over a problem in the middle of one or getting ready to have one. And that's a pretty good way to describe it. But I'd say more than that. An individual in seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto us. They're either just getting over fighting some problem, or they're in the middle of it, or they're going to be getting ready to fight another one. That is life. That's the way it works in this fleshly body. And until the Lord calls us home, 
we have to wear our armor and know how to use it and realize the warfare into which we've gotten ourselves when we were baptized into Christ and became a part of the Lord's army. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Well, we've already run across the blackness of darkness forever in verse 6. That's where the angels who kept not their first estate were put. And so it is. That's where people who refuse God, oppose God, fight God, will not follow God, go against his very commandments, then they're going to be in that particular place too. He goes back then to verse 14, and we see in Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. Well, we don't know exactly all about that, but I can tell you what he's going to do because Jude tells me when he comes with 10,000 of his saints. Notice 1,000 has an S on the end of it. That's a whole host, to say the least. When he comes at the end of time, and that's what he's talking about, all the angels come and all the redeemed of the ages come with him. Notice he's coming to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Brethren who are faithful to God should take great courage in that, because that means there's a, means there's a day coming when justice for everything there is and every person there is will be done. It's terrible when you have people saying there is no God. And man is just an accident coming from matter, which they consider to be eternal, through evolution to where we are now. What these atheists don't realize is that they're ruling out ever being complete justice done. And yet the atheist many times will cry out for justice, cry out for justice. Well, in this life, there are a lot of people who don't get justice. They're not dealt with correctly. But there's a day coming which all people will be dealt with by God who knows all things, and he will do it at the great judgment. Paul made it clear that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. It'll be on that day that the righteous will shine forth as the sun, and they shall hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. And those who have the judgment exercised upon them, those that Jude describes here, will here depart from me, I never knew you, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So he describes these kind of people. I think sometimes people read this and say, yeah, that was terrible back there in the first century, and you know how bad that world was. Well, it's right here today, too. Same type of people are out there now. And if we really were as bold as Paul and Peter and others were in proclaiming the truth and exposing error and marking who's a false teacher and who's a faithful teacher, one faithful to God, that is, that we might find out just exactly how rabid and hateful many people are. But when the Lord comes the second time, it'll be to execute judgment. Notice he further describes these Wicked characters. Verse 16. These are murmurers, complaining, walking after their own lusts. And their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons and admiration because of advantage. You other respect their respect of persons. They say what they think people want to hear because they think it'll do them good. That kind of person always will be around. 
murmurers here carries with it the idea of like the murmuring the children of Israel did. You go back over First Corinthians 10, you'll see they're listed there also. Well, the murmuring they did was to actually murmur against God and against Moses who God selected to be their leader. And so people today speak against God. They don't hesitate to. They misuse and abuse his will. They give lip service to him, but they don't intend from the heart to serve him. The Lord still asks, why I call you me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. But now Christians need to be aware of this. But I remind you again, these are not people outside of the church necessarily. Jude wrote this to members of the church about people in the church who were doing these things. Well, to say the best you can say about them is to say they're rotten characters. Can there be rotten characters in the church? Obviously so. How did the church ever apostatize in the first place? Except that people who knew the truth ceased to love it and began to practice that which was contrary to it. Notice verse 17. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this shows you again, Jude not being an apostle, how that they respected the apostles of Christ, the ambassadors of the court of heaven. Jesus selected them. It would be through them that he would deliver his last will and testament. Somebody may say, but Jude, people like Luke, James, why, well, they're not apostles. How did they write? By inspiration. Well, we've forgotten maybe that in 1 Corinthians 12, there are those nine miraculous gifts that were set in the church by the laying on of the apostles' hand because they didn't have a completed New Testament at that time. One of those gifts was the gift of prophecy. Every one of the writers, whether an apostle or whether someone like Jude or James, who wrote the New Testament, wrote by the gift of prophecy. Even the apostles did. They were moved as the Holy Spirit guided them. So all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It is truly the perfect, complete law of liberty, James 1.25. So they were to remember the words of the apostles. That was their duty. And you see immediately in Acts 2, verse 42, after the church was established, that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine because they knew that Jesus Christ, the head of the church and their Savior, was revealing his last will and testament through those apostles the ambassadors of the court of heaven. Uh, an ambassador from our nation or any other nation to another nation has what's called plenty potentiary power. He's in the official capacity to speak the official position of one government to another government. And the apostles are the only ones among men who were allowed and given the wherewithal by the Holy Spirit to speak the will of Christ. And the early church knew it. And we must make a difference here, and I guess we can talk about that a little bit here, the difference in inspiration and revelation. Every inspired person did not necessarily receive revelation. The apostles received revelation, and they were inspired to set it down flawlessly. Someone like Luke wrote by inspiration. Whatever he wrote and however he got his information, the Holy Spirit guided him infallibly to write it down. We need to know the difference in revelation and inspiration. But going on further, we see that these were, verse 18, that the apostles told them that they would be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly love. So the apostles were busy early on in telling the church 
People are going to come and they're going to make light of, they're going to scoff, they're going to mock at the truth of God, whatever it might be. But you have an obligation not to allow them to influence you. Notice they're walking after their own ungodly lusts. They're not guided by the word of God. Their lusts dominate them. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Notice these be they who separate themselves. Here's what they are. One little word, sensual, having not the spirit. Folks, when the spirit guides us today, I am living the Christian life by the work of the Holy Spirit. I have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. And the word of God is quick and powerful, alive and active sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, Hebrews 4 and verse 12. And so it is we have the wherewithal to forearm ourselves against how Satan operates through false brethren, to get our minds on the truth and let the truth cause us to see the world through it. And thus we're to judge not according to appearance, but we're to judge righteous judgment, John 7, 24. Remember, all of God's commandments are righteousness, Psalms 119, verse 172. If we judge according to righteousness, we're evaluating everything, beginning with ourselves, in the light of the teaching of the rightly divided word of God, 2 Timothy 2.15. That's the only way you can obey Colossians 3.17 when Paul said, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. So he says that uh, you can separate yourselves from these sensual people. They are not guided by the word of God. They're not interested in that level of living. They're sensual. Their appetites is anchored in their flesh and in the here and now and material things. But, he said, ye, beloved, that's like John does, but ye, you Christians, beloved, building up yourself. How do you do that? On your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, I might remind you that praying in the Holy Spirit would tie in to a great extent at what we noticed when John wrote. These brethren did have miraculous gifts. They could employ them for the reason they were given them. There were those who discerned the spirits. What do they mean? Miraculously, they could tell the difference in a false teacher and someone who wasn't. John said that when he said you have an unction from the spirit. And you know all things, all things you need to know pertaining to life and godliness. Well, today we have the word of God. And we know as we're obedient to him that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Well, we're called according to his purpose when we hear the gospel and obey it, being baptized into Christ. And we continue to live like the New Testament says, Christians are to live. Notice building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now what? Keep yourselves in the love of God. How do you do that? You keep on doing what God told you to do. There's no other way to do it. Yeah, I heard an old man say one time to some kids after he'd been giving them instructions, he says, do as you're told. Well, that's pretty blunt. That's exactly what God's saying. Do as you're told. You don't know the way in and of yourself how to go to heaven. In and of yourself, you can't save yourself. But God does. And that's what Jesus is saying when he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Luke 14, 15. So as we go further, keep yourself in the love of God. That's my responsibility. That's your responsibility. Christians, in their fellowship one to another, have an obligation to help each other to stay faithful. We should be able to depend upon one another to keep us faithful. 
So keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That's how we're saved by hope. We look beyond this wicked old world and the battles we fight, holding on to the truth, being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as we know our labor is not in vain in the Lord. So it is, Romans 15, rather, um, yes, Romans 15, 58, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, that we are able to be faithful and to set our affections on things above and not on things on the earth and to look to that day when we're beyond the old tempter's snare and all things material and the place of probation is over and done with. So we come further. And he says, and of some have compassion making a difference. You know, that means Christians have an obligation to know what's going on in their brother or sister's life. And you see when people are open to being rebuked, if you please, or being taught, or being led the right way, and when those bow their neck, and they're stubborn, and they're going to persist in their sin. And we're expected to make the difference in those two classes of people. How do I know that? Because that's exactly what he said. And of some, have compassion making a difference. We're expected to be of wise judgment and to discern people in the light of the truth for what they are, whether they're teachable or they're not teachable. And others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, ha hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. This is a sense of urgency. We don't have a forever. One of the things that has been a terrible thing over my years of preaching is see brethren act like they have forever to change their lives. And they don't. None of us know we'll see the sun rise in the morning or even whether we'll go to bed tonight. We have none. And the work of the church is the most urgent work there is in getting the gospel out to those who've never heard it and in keeping the church walking the straight and narrow way. That means individual responsibility. And we don't want to see people lost. And we do all we can to get them to open their eyes to their situation. So others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Are we to the point to where we see the flesh and its appetites to war against spiritual things, and thus we don't build to those things? Or by our actions and by our plans, are we building to those things that someday will no longer be? Well, we need to ask that question, because that's what Jane, uh, Jude is saying right here that Christians need to do. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And that's the way we ought to sum up everything we have to do in studying the Bible and in living to the Lord. Because he is our only hope. He is truly the way, the truth, and the life. Truly, he is the one and the only one that can save us through his gospel system of salvation. Nothing should be in our lives that's going to cause us to deviate, whether it's family, friends, monetary, wealth, whatever it is in this present world that causes us to cease from doing God's will and seeking to save the souls of our brethren and all those who need the gospel and are outside of Christ. And we continue to every uh, breath of air we take to urge people to obey the gospel and to live righteous to God. For the day is coming when we all must stand before the judgment bar of Christ to give account of the deeds done in the body. Let that be a day of rejoicing and of looking to the great eternity in a glorified state, even as Christ did. But we're going to consider this closed in the book of Jude. We'll try to start with First Peter the next time around. But before we close, let's go to our Heavenly Father and pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee again for this day. If I spared our lives, that we could be together in the study of thy word. Help us, Father, to not be spotted by the flesh, but help us to practice pure and undefiled religion. Keep ourselves from the affairs of this present world that would handicap us and the bill for eternity. We pray that thou wouldst forgive us of our sins if we repent of them and obey thee. 
Help us ever be ready to every good work. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.